Discussion on uh, Locke and Hobbes. Okay, so if you did not see that, um, I saved Rousseau for you guys. <laughs> okay, uh, I said uh, in the video yesterday, uh, welcome, Adney. Um, I paid, uh, I said uh, on the test, there's going to be a comparison between the social contract theory of Hobbes and Locke, okay, um, which you pretty much have what you need here. Now, the notes, especially at the bottom, the last part where it says the theory uh, of men in a state of nature, okay, um, so it'll just be a compare and contrast and um, if you couldn't see the notes, which I apologize, um, you might try and get them from somebody. Um, what I wrote on the board are some of the key points that I was that I'd be looking for when I grade that. Okay. Um, so today we're going to pick up with uh, Rousseau. So really, guys, it's a study of human nature, right? So it's trying to figure out what form of government works best for mankind. Where Hobbes has a very negative view, pessimistic view of man. We need a strong government where Locke has more faith in man, especially somebody that believes in God and truth, um, that those people can govern themselves. You know what I mean? And that's kind of what inspired the Declaration of Independence and inspired our system. Okay, So we give a lot of credit to Locke um, for our system of government and how we view um, our social contract. Now, warning, right? Warning is that we're losing God in this country. Therefore, we're losing that morality. Therefore, at some point, guys, we may need government to be more powerful over us so we can control our competitive and destructive ways. And I'm, I'm not advocating for that. I would certainly advocate more for a uh, revival in America of God. Um, rather than a overbearing government that controls us because we can't control ourselves. <laughs> okay. Um, and so we moved to Rousseau, and if you read that, guys, he's a very interesting cat. Um, uh, born in Switzerland, uh, and again, he's writing a little bit later than Locke. So Hobbes' theory comes first, then Locke, so these are kind of chronological. Okay, I love this quote, uh, not really, but man is born free, but he is everywhere in chains. Um, he's got an interesting take on this, okay? So he was really into education as well. He wrote some good stuff on, um, you know, and, that, and it's really way ahead of his time um, about how when we can learn better when we're actually involved in the learning physically. We've got different parts of the brain working. Neuroscience shows this is a, this is a thing. Okay, um, I I sometimes use music uh, in the background, which triggers different parts of the brain, which helps your brain function better uh, for some people. Okay, uh, did I tell you about that study I did last? last yeah. So uh, I didn't have as much success in my honors classes with that as my regular. Generally, because you're in an honors class, you guys can sit there for 45 minutes and hey, keep, you know, keep your attention span. I know that's hard for some of <laughs> right? Um, and the way I teach this is like a college class. So uh, it, I, I, sometimes I feel guilty because I know a lot of different learning strategies, but um, to get through the material, I find like this is the best way. And I tend to feel like I'm a pretty good lecturer. So, um, I've had success this way. So anyhow, Rousseau's uh, really up on that. Um, so if we look at his theory on the state of nature, okay? So what I talked about yesterday, state of nature is when you just have 
there's no government, okay? And so there's a historical development to that. Originally, it was peaceful and free only because an abundant of human nature, uh, of nature, and a small size of population. Once you get leisure time, people start to compare themselves, shame, envy, pride, contempt. Uh, the creation of proper private property uh, turns to greed, competition, vanity, inequality, and social classes. So when you look at that from an American perspective, the value of you know, private property that we have as Americans, um, this may fly in the face uh, of how you believe. Um, it certainly does me, okay? So, so look at his theory here. Um, so the argument, he argued that government established through social contract was to protect the rights of everyone. That's good, right? I mean, that's what Locke said, that government's role is to secure your natural rights. Now, Locke says those rights come from God, okay? But then he says it was really set up by the power to ensure their continued dominance of private property and therefore of society. We need to change this, okay? And he advocated for what kind of government? Who so? Strong and great democracy. Just a direct democracy, okay? So you have... Right, you have representative democracy, which is what Locke advocated for, and then you have direct, or someone called true democracy. Okay, um, and so with this, he talks about um, battling to the general will. Right now, guys, when you talk about democracy, the general will. Is 51%. Okay, or half plus one is the majority, the general will, okay, that we bow to this. Okay, one of the great things about a Republican form of government in a direct democracy, could, could minorities be targeted? I mean, if you're looking at minorities, could really be abused in this type of system. Okay, with a Republican government, okay, one of the things we'll learn about our Constitution is protecting minority rights. Okay, so if you have a Constitution that says these are the rights of everyone, okay, then they can't, you know, they can't be taken away by a majority. The rights exist, okay? But if, in a direct democracy, you can get um, kind of what's, what's known as mob rule or mobocracy. Mobocracy. Yeah. Okay. In fact, the founders of this country referred to direct democracy as mobocracy. Okay. So when you get people that are maybe not so balanced, okay, or people that get enraged, people that get upset, they get angry. They tend to act in a mob mentality. And you can see this with in a direct democracy where you get more than half the population angry about something, then you certainly, okay, I'm going to put that so everybody can see it. Hopefully you can see that, okay. Um, you can certainly get into a nasty situation. Now, if you guys, if you saw this, uh, what, Revolution did Rousseau's the ideas help inspire? French. Yeah, the French Revolution. Now, have you guys studied the French Revolution? I think in uh, English this year, are you guys going to read The Tale of Two Cities? Is that one of the books you're going to read? Yeah. Okay. And I, I think for a lot of seniors, that's one of the things you read. Okay. Which Tale of Two Cities is London and Paris? Okay. And so they detail really the um, the French Revolution, Dickens does, uh, in in the Tale of Two Cities. Uh, so you'll get another shot at the French Revolution. Um, was was the French Revolution bloody? <laughs> they used the guillotine, you know what I mean? It was, it was bloody, okay? And this is where you got, you know, this is rising up against the aristocracy. Okay, the French Revolution is. 
And um, so you get a lot of people uh, energized and angry, and you create this mob mentality. Okay, that's an army. Now, I want to read this, and then tell me if it reminds you of anything else. Okay. Legitimate sovereignty is derived from everyone's submission to the general will. And while such obedience may not be in everyone's personal interest, it is indeed what they really want, even if they don't realize it. They may need to be forced to be free. Okay. And then doing away with the harms of private property. Who could this have uh, inspired? Karl Marx. Karl Marx. Okay, so if you know about the Communist Manifesto and the ideas of communism, okay, where we're looking for equality uh, of outcome, okay, what we have in this country is what we try to provide is equality of opportunity, equality of uh, under the law, okay, but not equality of outcome. That's more of a socialistic and communistic view of the world where you have uh, government making sure that everyone is equal. Now, everywhere Marxist ideas have been tried, okay, where communism has tried to be implemented, um, it's, it's turned into a dictatorship, okay, where you have a very small, powerful group of people that never give up their power and become like everyone else. Well, when Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, guys, he, he knew that they would need a strong man, somebody to tear down the rich, the powerful, and bring them down to the level of everyone else and try and bring everybody up somewhere in the middle, right? And um, where everybody would have what they needed. And But those dictators or that strong man that comes to power doesn't ever give up their power. That's why we know their names. Stalin. Ho Chi Minh, Castro, Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il, Kim Il-sung, okay? We know their names. And so they, they never give up that power, all right? So this, now, historians argue over this. Did Rousseau inspire Marx? Okay, there are two sides of that coin. They share a lot of similarities, okay? Obviously, the French didn't become communists right after the French Revolution, okay? They established a Republican government and so forth over time, all right? So um, there is likely some inspiration here from Marx, okay? This was written before the Communist Manifesto, okay? Um, but it is interesting to you. Now, could we pull off a direct democracy in the United States today? I mean, guys, you hear politicians all the time talk about how we live in a democracy, and it drives me crazy because we have an uneducated public. We have people that don't know the difference. It's really sad. Okay, Maybe it was they had poor education, poor government teachers, or what have you. I don't know. But we don't live in a democracy okay? because we don't allow this. Okay, we don't allow mob justice. We don't allow, allow mob rule. We elect representatives. Okay, if we don't like our representatives, we change them. Okay, but could we pull it off today with the technology that we have? I mean, the government provides a lot for people. So couldn't they just provide everyone with one of these? And then every morning when you wake up, you've got notifications for what you have to vote on. We could all vote on every issue. And we could vote from our phones for president. Be a true democracy. With the technology we have, it's actually possible. Okay. Is it dangerous? A lot of people say it's dangerous. I mean, the founders of this country certainly thought it was dangerous. Okay. 
Now, we don't have a great history in this country of protecting minority rights, okay? We've gone a long way to correct that, okay? And we've done that through the Republican government, okay? Um, the Constitution states those rights that people have. It's just a matter of government catching up to fulfilling the promises of the Constitution and the Declaration. And we're working towards that every day, okay? Um, so, that's a pretty good look at these different um, political philosophies, okay, and social contract theories, and just really understanding that law is the one that most impacts our system, okay? But it's good to look at other ones as well. Yes? Yeah? Okay. Um, just a reminder, those five questions on the second treaties of civil government for John Locke are due tonight at 11.59. I've had, I don't know, about six or seven people turn them in. It's old English. It can be difficult to understand. Uh, you have to read it a couple times sometimes uh, to work your way through it to answer those questions. Okay, But if you show real good, honest effort at it, and I can tell you read it, um, I'll give you credit. Okay, if it's, sh if it's really shabby, then maybe you don't get full credit. But if I can tell you, you tried, um, made a legitimate effort, you'll get credit. Okay? You don't have to do it. It's, it's optional. Um, good? All right. So, we're going to get back into uh, some notes. And from here, guys, we're going to be looking at different forms of government. All right? Now, I'm going to use different criteria to talk about different forms of government. All right? We're going to look at really three different criteria. Okay, you don't have to write this down yet. The first one is going to be geographic distribution of power. The second one is going to be economic theories. And then we're going to look at the relationship between legislative and executive branches as forms of government. Okay, so we're looking at more uh, and number of people that can participate. Okay, so we're going to start with different forms of government. That's your header. Okay. Different forms of government. Okay. And the first criteria we're going to use is geographic distribution of power. And I've got three different systems. How many? Three different systems when it comes to geographic distribution of power. You know what? I'm going to make this easy on you. Okay? I'm going to pull up. Are you like stuck? Or... I'm going to pull up some notes that I use my regular class, which appears to be already over there. For this, okay. Now I may add a couple of things to this. Where are you at, Mouse? No. Okay. So what we're looking at, where the power lies. Does the power lie at the national level, the regional level, or the local level? Okay. So the first system we're going to talk about is called a unitary system of government. Okay. You guys can see that. Okay. So, unitary systems of government, look at the size of these boxes, okay? These boxes, I'm just going to put this here. Describe the unitary system, okay?
most republics in the world today use this system, okay? All the real power lies at the, with the big unit, okay? Think of the big unit being the national government, okay? So this is top to bottom type government, okay? All real powers held at the national level, okay? Now, when we elect in Wichita, Wichita, Kansas, who is the highest elected official in the city of Wichita? The mayor, Mayor Whipple is his name, okay? Now, Mayor Whipple and our local government, get to make decisions for us here in Wichita, okay? Some decisions. Now, when we talk about the mask mandate, okay, under the mandate we're under in Sedgwick County right now, okay, who gave us that mandate? Was it President Trump? Did that come from the national level? Nope. Did it come from Governor Kelly at the state level? Does everybody in the state have to wear a mask? No, that decision was made at the local level. Okay, so in a unitary system, the national government, say in Great Britain, okay, could mandate a national mask mandate. Uh, candidate Biden, um, about two weeks ago, said, I'm in favor of a national mask mandate. Okay, and then his advisors told him, uh, Joe, you don't have the power to do that. You know, Congress would have to pass a law. Okay. You just can't do that. Okay. And so, in fact, uh, for a while, we did have a statewide mandate, didn't we? Okay. And so did some other states. But the Kansas state legislature said, we're giving too much power to the governor here. Because you may live in a county in Kansas. There's 105 counties in Kansas. Okay. So you may live in a county where there's, you know, 6,000 people and you have three cases. Should everybody be forced to wear masks? Well, that's up to them in that county, okay? Not up to the government, all right? So we don't use this system. Now, are we trending in this direction? The answer is yes, okay? So in, say, Great Britain, they may elect a mayor, okay, of London, but the directives come down from the national government, okay? In some cases, these local representatives are just federal employees that are sent to administer government at the local level and state level or regional level, okay? Different countries use different terms for this regional state. Canada, they use provinces, and, you know. Switzerland, they use cantons. Mexico uses states. We use states. Okay. All right. So there's your first geographic uh, distribution of power at the national level. Okay. You might be able to figure out this is the system we use. Okay. And it's called a federal system. All right. Federalism. You notice the size of the boxes, okay? They're all the same. That's the way it was designed anyways, okay? Now, truly you might make the national one just a little bit bigger based on the supremacy of the national government that they have. Okay, so national, the U.S. Constitution, the national constitution does trump state and local laws, okay? But some powers, so this is where we talk about where the power lies. In a federal system, powers are divided or shared between the three. Some powers are unique to the national government. Some powers are unique to state and local government. 
Let me give you an example. Can Kansas declare war on Canada? No, it doesn't have that power. The power to declare war lies solely with the national government, more specifically Congress. Okay, can Kansas print its own money? No, okay, so the Constitution lays out the powers that are given to the national government, okay? Now, when a power is not listed in there for the national government, it's reserved to the states and local governments or the people, okay? So when we talk about uh, the Constitution, nowhere in the Constitution is the word education mentioned. Education is not discussed in the Constitution. So if it's a power not given to the national government, who has the power to administer public education? State and local governments. Okay, so we have USD 259, USD 266, USD what have you, right? Those are governments, unified school districts. They all have school boards that are elected individuals. Okay, and they set the curriculum and the rules for the schools in their community. However, we do have a state board of education as well. Okay, that sends directives to the local governments. Now, guys, in 1976, the U.S. government established the U.S. Department of Education. Now, I'm not sure how the United States survived from 1776 to 1976 without a U.S. Department of Education. I don't know how we survived without the national government telling us how to educate our students. Of course, I'm being facetious there, yes? Okay. They have no role in this. And I think constitutionally, you can challenge the fact that we are spending hundreds of billions of dollars of our taxpayer money on the U.S. Department of Education that employs tens of thousands of people and occupies a very large building in Washington, D.C. Now, they, the, the U.S. Department of Education gives about 8% of funding to public schools around the country. Okay. But about 90% of the paperwork and rules that schools at state level and local level have to follow come from the national government. Okay. I am an advocate for abolishing the U.S. Department of Education. Okay. Kansas can handle educating parents and communities can handle educating the youth. We don't need a national curriculum. Okay. You might have heard some of the argument about Common Core and stuff like that, okay? Um, do, we want a, do we want every student in America to be taught the exact same thing? And this is one of the things I really like about teaching at Bishop Carroll, is that I have academic freedom. Okay, if I want to spend three days talking about federalism because I think it's important, I can do that. Okay, if I have a national curriculum, it's kind of like AP classes, right? AP classes, here's the curriculum. They're going to be tested over this. Cover the curriculum. Okay, somebody else writes the test. Okay, I write the tests. Okay, you guys know how you have the DRT? Okay. The, um, our former superintendent, Bob Volgaril, you know, because if you don't pass the DRT, you have to do remediation. Well, we do the same thing in social studies, where if you don't pass the department test, you have to do remediation. You guys will take that test at the end of the year. Now, you could pass it, most of you, right now, easy with flying colors, without studying it or having been through the two classes that you're going through this year. Okay. It's that easy. Okay. But he wanted to use the state assessment from the state for remediation purposes, okay? And I stood up and said, no, 
because what we would be doing as teachers at Bishop Carroll is teaching to the test that somebody else wrote what they thought was important, okay? And I think uh, that really devalues what can take place in here, okay? If you guys have a question about anything, if you ever ask a question, there's been a couple in here, not very many, but I can take the next 15, 20, 30 minutes or 45 minutes to talk about that. And I'm not on somebody else's schedule, okay? When people ask questions, and they're interested, this is where a lot of good learning takes place, okay? But if you have, if you want to create a situation where everybody knows the exact same thing throughout the country in an attempt to make us all think the exact same way, that's dangerous. That's what the Nazis did. They had a national curriculum that every student would have to learn and be taught and tested over specific material that the Fuhrer, the leader, wanted them to know. It's dangerous, okay? So this is why we set up this system this way, all right? So what do we do at the local level that is not done at the national level? Well, it's supposed to be education, but you could look at things like um, community policing, so local police forces, okay? We do have federal law enforcement, okay? But they don't have much interaction with the general public, okay? It's so. Firefighting is something we do at the local level. So you have Sedgwick County Fire Department. You don't have the Kansas Fire Department. You know what I mean? You have the local fire department, okay? Libraries, public libraries, okay? These are things done at the local level. And then you have state and then national, okay? This tug of war between the three of these has been a source of much consternation since the beginning of our country. The Civil War was fought over what? Slavery, okay. Well, really, if you dig a little deeper, right, it's about the, the southern states saying the national government doesn't have the power to tell us that we can't own human beings as property. The national government doesn't have that power. Okay. Well, <laughs> so they broke away. So this was an argument over federalism. Okay. Obviously, they were wrong about that argument. The, the nice thing about the national government and the U.S. Constitution is it's an umbrella that covers every citizen of this country. Your rights are protected by the national Constitution, and therefore this body can enforce civil rights laws that protect your rights in your state. So if you're an African-American person living in Mississippi or Alabama or South Carolina, in that state, is not protecting your civil rights, this body can come in and enforce those civil rights and protect citizens from their states and local communities that want to mistreat them, okay? So that's kind of, I will, you know, generally uh, not really fond of federal power myself, okay? So I would like to, you know, kind of bash on the national government sometimes, but, there is a there's a good reason to have it, and that one of those is to protect your your rights, okay, everybody's rights, right? So, and there's other positives as well, okay. So, that's federal system. Now, the third geographic distribution of power is something that we try in this country, not federal, but confederal. So you'll remember, right, our first Constitution was the Articles of Confederation. I actually showed up a little better like that. So to define confederal, an alliance of independent states. By the way, guys, in your notes, put a star next to federal federalism. Highlight it, bold it, put a star next to it. 
That definition of federalism, guys, this right here, this is something I want you to know. Okay? If you were to ask, go on the street and ask the American people, what system of government do we use? I would bet you to say that 95% of Americans would not say federalism. What would an uneducation, uneducated person say? What kind of system of government do we use? Democracy. Okay. So you have forms of government and then you have systems. This is a system of government. Okay. So our first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, which is pictured here in the background, okay, did not work for us. As you can see, all the real power lies at the state and local level. And the national government is given very little authority, okay? Now, you can understand why the leaders of this country after the American Revolution would want to do this, right? They just came from a system where the king and the parliament dictated to them without a right to vote, taxation without representation, and so forth. So you can see them wanting to create a national government that was very weak, without much power, okay? The first national government in this country had 13 people in it. <laughs> one, one, one representative from each state. They did not have the power to tax. So when there were disputes between the three states, there's only one branch of government. There's no executive branch. There's no judicial branch. It's just one body, the legislative branch, with 13 people. And when there started to be squabbles between the different states, and there were a lot of arguments, problems with uh, borders, problems with navigation between the states, Navigation of rivers, bodies of water, okay? <laughs> I just heard this, well, I read this yesterday. Now, remember I was talking about media? Some things get reported in the news and some don't, okay? So this is not widely reported. Uh, remember when I was talking about Kosovo and Serbia and had to put in UN peacekeepers there? In the 90s, there was ethnic cleansing. You remember that? Okay, so President Trump helped to oversee a, this dispute between them, and they've agreed to open up economic channels between Serbia and Kosovo. And there's this lake that sits between the two regions, and it's under great dispute. About 80% of the lake is surrounded by Serbia and 20% by Kosovo. Kind of divides the two. And, I mean, they've been arguing over this for decades. And they both have different names for the lake. So what do map makers put, you know, on the map? They just decided to change the name of the lake. Both prime ministers from both sides. That lake is now called Lake Trump. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Okay. Now, was that reported on ABC, CBN, CBS, and ABC? No. CNN, did they cover that? No. Okay. You, I had to go to right-wing media to even know that that happened. Okay. Reuters didn't report on it. Okay. So it's just that's just kind of reinforcing what I was talking about earlier. But anyhow, this isn't going to work for us. Okay. Because the national government is so so weak. So we write the new constitution in 1787, creating a federal system. Okay. Most use unitary. Some use federal. Canada still uses this, so they have their three big provinces, right, or uh, five provinces, six, and they basically have autonomy over themselves, like Quebec. In Quebec, they speak what? French. The others speak English, all right? They have their own autonomy, their own, kind of their own sovereignty with a national government that doesn't have a lot of power, okay? Russia has really kind of turned it into a mobocracy no 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 mafiaocracy it's it's run by uh 
what we call oligarchs, uh, really rich supporters of Vladimir Putin. Okay. And so he's got his friends in each state and he kind of orders them around. Okay. But a really good example is the European Union. Okay. Uh, my wife and I were fortunate enough in 1999 to go to Europe. And we did uh, 17 days. So we went to Britain, flew into Britain, went to Scotland, went to France, uh, went to Germany, went to Austria, went to Italy, and then back to France and Britain, flew home. Okay. In 1999, they just started the European Union. And you guys have all heard of the euro, right? The currency, the euro. And Britain, because the British pound was so much more valuable than, say, the Italian lira or the German mark or the franc that the French use, Britain decided to keep the, the pound. Uh, and when we were there in 99, they didn't have the euro out yet, but you could buy euro traveler's checks. Okay. Within a few years, everybody else in Europe is using the euro. Okay. Uh, this really benefited some poor European countries like Greece, okay, and Italy, which, I mean, I remember buying, you know, go buy lunch in Italy, and it's like 11,000 lira, okay, which today would be about 7 euro. Over the years, inflation in these countries with their currency, you know, it was very, you had to have a lot of money, okay, but because the currency was not valued. So you'd make more, but your salary would be more in lira, which is not as valuable, okay. So this was put together for economic and political cooperation. Now, you guys are pretty educated. Two years ago, this country in the European Union voted to leave Britain. Okay, they called it Brexit. Okay, like exit Britain, exiting the European Union. Okay, see what began to happen as the European Union over the years, this body, which was the head of the European Union heads, which they would send to, it's kind of like the United Nations. We have an ambassador to the United Nations. We don't get the people, we don't get to elect the ambassadors to the United Nations. Okay, there's over 200 of them. But then they start to try and make decisions for us in the United States, the United Nations. And I'm like, wait a second, we don't get to elect you. How do you have any say over how we live? Right? You know what I mean? And so the people of Britain, some of them, at least 51%, said, you know what, we don't we don't like this. Okay, the European Union is demanding that we do things that we don't want to do. Okay, so we're gonna leave. So Really, the European Union was built to compete economically against the United States. They're stronger together as an economic force than they are individual countries. Okay, so um, it is a really good example of a confederal system that starts to turn unitary, like our federal system, that more and more power to the federal government. Listen, when you have a unitary system, you have a very small number of people making decisions for everybody. In our federal system, we have a lot more people in the decision-making process, okay? We're not dictated to from the top, okay? And that's kind of what's happening with the European Union, uh, but not in Canada, okay? So it works with the smaller countries, it may work for good. Yeah? Um, Canada has universal health care. Mm -hmm. um, it does not sound like a good idea to have universal health care with a very small national government. Right. So that's when the state and local governments cede some power to the national government. Okay. So when they agree, okay, we'll go along with what the national government says. Now, that wouldn't have been able to take place, a single-payer system in Canada, had not the provinces said, yes, we'll go along. Some of them actually probably could have opted out of that. Okay. Well, I mean, like the system, like in general... With a small national government, can have less regulation of each hospital, and that explains why they're understaffed and underfunded. Less taxation, yeah. because the national government's not going to be able to tax as much. Yeah. Okay, um, 
Yeah, it can. I, I can see how that can create problems. Yeah. All right. So my next lecture next week will be on different forms of government based on the number of people that can participate in government. Okay. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend.